Let's get started. Ooh, does this thing work now? No, it still doesn't. OK. All right. Welcome back, everyone, to the final lecture of CS 107. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, let's get into things real quick. Um, just a couple of announcements. Mostly today, uh, as I mentioned on the kind of on the website, it's mostly just kind of a little informal, just a just a chat about where we ended up and what kind of exciting prospects are are, are open to you now that um, you've worked all, um, you've worked so hard throughout this this quarter and sort of where where, we, where we can go from here. A uh, couple of announcements to kind of round things out. Uh, we've got. The two things that I'm sure are very much looming on your minds, uh, assignment seven and the final exam. So we've got assignment seven. Uh, that is just a reminder, due uh, this coming Wednesday, the first, with the hard deadline of Saturday the 4th, keeping in mind that that is in the middle of final exams. So please plan accordingly. Uh, we highly encourage you to get the submission in by the 1st. And a reminder that we will take absolutely no submissions uh, after the hard deadline um, with no exceptions. We have to get these things graded, and we have to get them graded pretty, pretty quickly. So we can't really make any kind of any sort of exceptions like that. So please make sure to get on that and to get something in you know, um, by the deadline, or at worst, the hard deadline. Uh, we've got the final exam coming up. I guess that's uh, about a week and a half from today. Uh, so that's going to be on the 8th uh, at 1215 at 3:15. That's like right at the end of the exam window. So this should not run into any other class exams pretty much. Um, we only have one exam room this time. That's kind of nice. So we'll all be in Dink. Um, so please don't come here for that. You won't find anybody. Or if you do, they won't have anything to do with us. So that could be bad. And then just a quick note to our SCPD students and also to anyone who has, for example, an OAE accommodation, um, please get in touch with us at the staff email list again. Uh, even if you've uh, gotten in touch with us for the midterm, please make sure you, you specifically email us about the final so that we can make a new list of SCPD uh, remote students and OAE students and things like that. Um, and then just a note about uh, so the practice final. We will have a practice final. Uh, that will be posted within the next uh, two or three days. Um, turns out the process of updating that to uh, work with the new 64-bit and stuff is, is maybe a little bit longer than normal. So we just need to make sure that it's correct and that uh, there are no surprises. OK. Uh, everyone OK with that? Any lo final logistic kind of stuff? Cool, cool. So the plan for today is just kind of wrap up. Sort of, you know, so the, I'm kind of breaking this up into two different pieces, which is sort of like, all right, you know, we've just spent uh, nine ish weeks working through a bunch of really challenging, really intense material. Um, so, part of what I want to summarize for you today is just kind of why does that matter? And hopefully, I can get some of you to, to chip in on that, um, you know, what you thought was, was useful to get out of. Out of this class, but also kind of, I want to give you a little bit of a sense of where C shows up in in the real world, um, where people care about systems and the work that we've been doing this quarter. And then I want to give you an overview of kind of where to go from here, whether that be in later classes, whether that be with uh, jobs, internships, research, um, just kind of anything um, in and beyond computer science. So yeah, mostly I'm going to be kind of off slides. I'm just going to sort of talk this stuff through, but I'll leave that there. I want to show you a couple little little pieces. Um, so I kind of just want to talk a little bit about, you know, where exactly we've ended up, and I want to just talk about like uh, how where 107 kind of fits in in the sort of grand scheme of computer science in the in the big picture of the major. Um, so. Maybe just a, a little story here. Uh, it, for those who are interested in CS and who don't already know about them, we have a course advisor uh, who is a graduate student um, whose job it is to help uh, CS majors and prospective CS majors and, and also grad students, um, undergrads and grad students, uh, you know, to sort of 
know what the lay of the land is in terms of classes, requirements, uh, jobs, research, and, and all that. Um, they can just give you general advice as well as sort of specific things like, am I going to graduate? Uh, do I need to, you know, do I, what should, what, how should I plan out my requirements and things like that? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were interviewing for this course advisor position, and one of the questions that we asked the prospective uh, course advisors was, if a student came up to you and asked you um, and said that they only had time to take three CS classes, which classes would you recommend and why? And as I understand it, um, pretty much everybody we interviewed said 107 as one of those three classes. Um, and I, I think that's somewhat telling as to sort of where 107 is positioned sort of in, in the, the grand scheme of things. Um, so, but so, so instead of you know, me sitting here, I'm sure I can make a, some kind of a list about all the things like why, why 107 is, is, would go on to uh, these folks' lists and whatnot. But maybe I'll, I'll open up to you a little bit. Um, you know, what kind of things do you feel like if there was one thing that your friend or something said, okay, you know, I'm going to take 107 or I'm, I'm thinking about it. Um, from whatever background, you know, that you can, that, that you're interested in, in taking on it, um, you know, what would be something that you thought was pretty useful, um, so, something like kind of the most valuable thing you felt like you got from this class? Anyone want to throw anything out there? Anything? <laughs> <laughs> I guess one, understanding the nitty gritty. Um, yeah. A couple of concepts that previous classes always brushed off as, oh, you don't need to know it. Oh, don't worry about it. Yeah. In that sense, getting more into the was really meaningful. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure how much the SPD are getting the the student responses. So um, the comment was uh, get, looking at the kind of the nitty gritty details that sometimes <coughs> previous classes, and I actually think to some extent future classes even, right, will totally brush off as like, yeah, yeah, that, that happens, that's system stuff, right? Like, well, this is system stuff. And, and now, you know, hopefully you get a, a feel for that kind of, those kind of details now um, and, and knowing how that works. Anything else? Using a debugger like GDB. All right, so using a debugger like GDB, yes, that is a very important uh, aspect of of what we're trying to build up here. Um, I can tell you that, you know, as you move on through the classes, for example, and um, if you were to continue, for example, 110, uh, that's all just going to come back, right? And in fact, in 110, um, the TAs don't look at your code. And they are they are they are somewhat assuming that you are going to be able to walk into that class with a good you know a good feeling of how to GDB your way through something, how to use Valgrind to get information about um, memory management, um, you know, kind of that that space. Okay. That's learning how to like read assembly. Yeah, learning how to read assembly. Um, you know, it's, that's really starting to get into an area of like, this could be really relevant to you. Um, I can tell you that um, there are a couple of uh, 170 TAs in a downstream class, and um, they sure were reading a lot of assembly the last couple of days. Um, anyone who came to my office hours maybe. Uh, so I'm working through that. Like, yeah, it turns out that that does kind of come up um, in more ways than you might expect. Um, assembly does kind of rear its ugly head in a sense. Um, but just kind of having that, that working knowledge. Understanding what goes on behind the scenes of a more high-level programming language? Yeah, so understanding what's going on behind something like a higher-level programming language, right? So like, um, now you're actually pretty equipped to understand how Java or JavaScript or Python or all these other languages um, work uh, in a Longer quarter, if, you know, for fall and winter, we spend a lecture or two talking about Python and just kind of comparing and contrasting and saying, look, you know, we learned all these things about memory and pointers and addresses. Hey, guess what? That's still there when we're in Java, when we're in Python. It still exists. It's just that uh, the language is trying to kind of hide that from you in a sense. Great. Um, anything else? Something that like wasn't fun, but having the focus not be on like learning C, 
but on just getting the assignments done, um, increased my confidence in being able to just get like, like try downs. Yeah, so so the comment is just sort of you know feeling like you really have to kind of make those assignment deadlines. Like uh, you know, believe us, we realize how sort of generally challenging this this class is, how much the kind of workload is. Um, certainly in a spring quarter when we also lose week ten because of the Memorial Day holiday, uh, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty kind of a it can be kind of a rush, kind of a bit of a crunch sometimes, but. We do hope that a certain part of that is kind of, right, as you say, kind of building up this confidence. Like, yeah, I can sit down in a week and just kind of work through some issues. I can work through um, what I'm being asked to do. I can solve problems. I can get unstuck, uh, sometimes with help, sometimes on my own. And I can just make deadlines. And that's going to be really important, right? It's going to be important kind of anywhere you go. Uh, doesn't have to just be restricted to classes, but you know, even in kind of job environments and, and research, things like that. Right. There are always going to be these, these deadlines. There's always going to be this kind of, all right, you just got to make something happen. Like, what's it going to take? Digging through man pages and searching out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Details. Yeah, so, so man pages, kind of the details, right? So there's kind of that, you know, so kind of coming back to this, like, knowing where to get help. Right? Um, in maybe in, you know, 106A, 106B, you, you, could, you could kind of, Rely on the textbook. You can rely on this, these nice little, well, you know, totally written out handouts about here is every function you're ever going to need to know um, from this class. Or, or maybe you had these nice little web-based Java docs that you could just control F your way through the whole thing. And, um, and, and that's seldom going to be the reality uh, of much of uh, of a lot of different aspects. So being able to kind of work through a man page, being able to work through um, uh, some kind of an, an interface, right? Being able to pull up a .h file and say, what are what does this function take, and what does it return, and what are the edge cases? Um, these are all these are all really useful skills. Um, great, yeah. Um, anything else? Is there anything that um, maybe you're you know so uh, supposing that you are. Um, interested in say, moving on to like another CS class or something like that. Anything you're excited to maybe leave behind here? Anyone like, yeah, I, maybe I'm just not coming back to C for a little while? I mean, this is mostly just for me because I know most people use Sublime, but I hate using them. <laughs> um, all right. Well, yeah. So text editors, uh, command line text editors. It's funny, you know. I um, when I took 107, I absolutely just used a graphical text editor. I used I used Gedit on my on my machine, but I was on Linux. Um, and then I think it was sophomore year or junior year. I was doing something. I was doing some research project, and my text editor just like broke because of some update or something. And I was like, well, guess I just have to commit to learning them properly. And I spent. I don't know, like three months learning them, like daily. I would spend maybe an hour or two each day before I went to work, like before I went, went in uh, to the office, just doing, just like reading up on, on Vim tricks and stuff. And, um, you know, I sure did learn Vim. And that I actually, I, I've totally, I've actually totally written essays in Vim. Like, it's actually gotten to the point that, like, I'll take a, like, I'm taking, like, a humanity, like, social science class. And I'm like, okay, I need to draft my essay. I could do this in Word, but gosh, you know, it's so nice to be able to, like, CW, change some words. Yeah, I'm just going to write this in Vim, and I'm going to copy paste it over to the editor, to the word processor later. Uh, so that can happen. I don't know. Do I recommend it? Probably not. But Anything else that you're like, yeah, I'm going to be real excited to. Take a different approach. Well, assembly was kind of torturous. To go through, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's definitely kind of part of this. Like, hey, do I ever have to see assembly again? Um, usually, no. Um, even in downstream systems, right? So, so that's that's pretty nice um, in some sense. Like, I think I think the general advice that that I would give for working at different levels of abstraction is just like, you know, if you're going to work at abstraction level X. Right, you kind of do have to know how x minus one and x plus one both work. You kind of need to be able to. So, say you were programming like a web application, you know, you kind of do a little bit need to know how the internet works. It's pretty hard to really write good web software without knowing 
what it's built on without knowing what the browser is doing behind your back and what assumptions it's making. I think actually a lot of um, developers have kind of found this out over the course of the last, I would say, decade or 15 years, right? Like, oh, well, could I just you know, write some Java, write some PHP or whatever, and just call it a day uh, and never worry about efficiency, never worry about what the web server is doing. And a lot of these larger companies, as they're scaling up and things, are realizing, no, no, you do need to know uh, a little bit about stack versus heap. You need to know about pointers versus mem you know, pointers, memory addresses, all that stuff. Um, and so, there, so in some sense, right, there's maybe a, probably a smaller subset than the whole class at large who, who will need to know something about ISAs and assembly, and, and, and that will sometimes come up. Um, let me give you a couple of, let me just uh, switch over here a little bit and just give you a couple of examples of, um, of some, some cool stuff that I, I hope you can kind of feel like you got um, out of the class. And, and these are just kind of somewhat picking up back on, on what, we were, what we've talked about before, but also, like, so this first example, I kind of just want to point out sort of two key examples. One is just um, that now that You've gone through all that, those nitty gritty details, all the, the C and the, even the assembly and all that. Um, on the first day of class, I told you some, a little bit about this really fun security bug um, that was discovered last December that was lurking in uh, the code of a pretty commonly used bootloader um, since 2009. And here's the code. Um, and I actually just want to put this up there, you know, just as a, like, so I, I actually went into the, so this code is open source, and I just went in and copied, copied the code. I think I deleted a few new lines, but I did not actually change the code in any formal way. Um, for example, you know, you'll notice they use one set of true um, for various reasons. But you can kind of see this code, right? And it should look really familiar. Um, it should look really similar to the kind of C code that you've been writing and you've been working through. Yeah, okay, that's not a function that you know exists, right? What does get key do? Eh, whatever. But um, you can nevertheless, you know, you see a call to memset. Maybe that was a function that you've, uh, you've used here and there. And um, anyone see the bug? Kind of a fun little bug. I guess I just isolated it. All right, so what happens if curl n is zero? And we subtract one from it. So, so if we enter a backspace on the keyboard, we can make curlen go to what value does it go to? Hmm? You went max, right? Because it's unassigned. Right, right, okay. Doesn't actually matter here, interestingly enough, because now we take the mem set. So we start with, with buff, which is some pointer that the, the client has passed us, right? And we add curlen. So when we do the addition, that's going to wrap around. Um, there's actually a really interesting. Small data point here, which is that it's actually, this is running on 32 bit, so this actually ends up, um, this would have a slightly different effect on 64 bit. That's not super important. Anyway, the point is we mem set before the start of the array. How exciting. What did we get there? I don't know. Uh, maybe it was return address. Or maybe we just took over the machine, right? Um, so this is a bug. It was kind of neat. Um, and I guess, you know, okay, it's one thing to be able to just, you know, pick out these, these pieces of code, and I'm sure you'll find a lot of examples. There was, Shell shock, there was heart bleed. These are the kinds of things that came up in the last couple of years. Maybe you heard about them in the news. Maybe you were like, yeah, whatever, techie people doing techie things, whatever. But, but I, I hope that this, this is just a kind of a small little snippet to just give you a sense that you can kind of read very real C code. Um, one of the things that you could potentially do, probably after you know, Heap Allocator, you can totally go and like download libc, and you can go read what qsort does. You can read what strcomp does. Um, you can see all the really cool bit tricks that strlen uses to actually not run in quite o of n time. It actually runs in a slight, like, 8x faster than your naive o of n. Um, and, and you can really kind of start to work these things out, right? Um, and this is, this is real production code, right? This isn't just, this, and this isn't just code that, systems programmers need. This isn't just code that you have to know if you're actually writing these, you know, if you're calling mem copy yourself. But libc, for example, is something that every, pretty much every uh, program on your machine counts on, if not indirectly. Um, the Python interpreter, the Java virtual machine, all of these things are going to build on top of libc, right? Um, and, and, and so hopefully you can feel that there's a certain amount of 
power, a certain amount of confidence, a certain amount of, yeah, like I can go and pick this up and you know, someone can hand me a piece of C code and I can just you know, eat it up, right? Here we go. Um, and then just kind of a, maybe a little bit of a transition into, um, some of you might you know, maybe thinking, okay, yeah, that's cool, but like, I'm probably not gonna program in C again. Right? Uh, like, who cares? Right? Isn't, isn't C kind of this old fashioned, nobody really cares about this language? Uh, so, the IEEE, the, uh, the consortium of engineers and whatnot, puts out, uh, does a survey based on things like uh, Google search terms, uh, GitHub repos, which track language, things like that. Um, uh, job ads posted on like career builder and places like that um, for sort of the top they have a list of 48 languages that they check for and so I got I extracted the list from 2015 um, and sorted it by and, and I used their filter for the top languages that they saw in job postings Right, so of all the kind of job ads that they were running into, like what are the top languages? And maybe the list surprises, might surprise you a little bit. So here at the top we see Java. Maybe that's not super surprising. Um, Java's just kind of everywhere. But I mean, number two right there is, is C, right? And then you can kind of go down the list, Python, C Sharp, C++, all that good stuff. Um, you know, maybe you've heard of some of these languages. Shell is number 10. And then uh, if you're wondering, uh, good old number 48 with a, re with a rating of 0.0, .0 is OCaml. <laughs> uh, if you don't know what OCaml is, then you're probably better off. Um, it's, it's a good old time. Anyway, I, I don't actually know why it's, I don't know how they decided what's on the list. There is assembly on the list. I didn't see where it was. Um, but you know, I think, so there's a link here. Um, I want to post the slides and, and you can try to, go there, you can play with some filters. You can actually like see, hey, what are the top languages that are on, on GitHub? What are the top languages that are trending? Apparently C is trending. I didn't, like, I, I clicked the trending tab and C went to number one. I think second was like C++. I was like, I don't know what this means, so I'm not gonna put it in my slide. Cause like, why is C trending in 2015? I'm not sure. Uh, they call it rapidly growing and they're like, oh, neat, cool. I don't know, I believe you, I guess, but Certainly, there are lots of jobs out there um, that expect some amount of C knowledge, if not C++, but probably actually a lot of stuff is still being written in C. And that's not just because it's legacy. That's not just because it's old fashioned and people don't, um, don't want to change, although sometimes there may be a little bit of that. But it is because um, a, lot of, a lot of technology does depend on performance. A lot of it depends on efficiency and and then some aspects of it depend on being really close to the hardware and really feeling uh, like you have control over the memory, have control over the pointers, the generated assembly. And that turns out to be really important in a lot of different fields. Um, so, yeah, still relevant. <laughs> so, maybe I can give a bit of a, I, Oh, so I think one of the best lines of that article, so, so the, not on the linked article, but there was a related one. Um, someone posted a comment at the bottom of the article that said, uh, and this, so the article was posted in 2015, and the, the commenter said, 20 years ago, I had a professor who told me that C would be dead in two years. <laughs> and uh, and then so, so this uh, person concludes, uh, clearly they were wrong, but I'm actually still having a lot of trouble figuring out what in the world that professor was thinking 20 years ago. Like, what was going to take over C back in 1997? I mean, I, it's one thing to say that, that C is going to go, go away now. I think most people are pretty, uh, have pretty much come to the conclusion, if not reluctantly, some people perhaps, that C is not going away. Um, and it's not going to go away in two years. It's not going to go away in five. It's not going to go away in 20, most likely. Um, I think that it, it's, it's at the point where it's just so kind of ingrained in what, uh, a lot of systems is uh, that it just really is kind of, it just really solves a lot of problems that a lot of other languages don't. Um, how you guys feeling? Yeah? Maybe a bit of a, a bit of a, I guess kind of a slight caution though as we kind of walk away from this class. Um, so this kind of comes back a little bit to the, the comments, one of the, actually the comments that, um, that uh, Meredith, our uh, 
a student services uh, administrator in, in the CS department kind of mentioned to me uh, while doing these interviews for the course advisor, um, one, of the, one of the candidates who mentioned 107 as one of the top three classes that they thought you know, everybody should, every, I'm not sure exactly what the filter was, um, but that, that they would recommend to someone who wanted to take three CS classes. Um, one of their comments was, you know, after taking 107, like, I'm surprised my computer can even turn on at all. <laughs> and I think, like, I think it's easy to get into this, a bit of a trap there, right? Where we spend so long talking about integers and floating point and assembly, and at some point you kind of look back and you're like, wait, like, you know, I type in 1 plus 1, the number comes out 2, like, is something going on there? Is there some like binary magic here? Like, is, am I going to run into overflow if I take x plus y? On one hand, there's some real power in that. There's some certainly some, you know, very relevant thought processes. We've seen lots of different examples of overflow and of floating point round off being real problems. But I do want to kind of warn you against breaking abstractions and going kind of, you know, really kind of picking the right tool for the job. Right, so one thing that I think uh, used to happen more as we, you know, as students came out of 107 and went into 110, and I hope this is happening a lot less now, is that students would come out of 107 thinking, oh man, I've got so much power over memory and pointers that I'm just going to take it. Like, when I don't need it, I'm just going to take it. And so, you know, they'd get some assignment where they had to go through an array of ints, and they would think, oh gosh, I can't trust the compiler to do array bracket i. I need to cast this to a void star, and then store it, and then I need to cast it to a care star, and then add i times size of int, uh, except maybe I'm worried about the size of my int, so maybe I should just hard code the number, I don't know. And then, of course, I can't just read an int out, because what about overflow? So I'm going to mem copy. Um, you know, and at some point, you kind of look at it, and you say, well, there's a lot of really solid abstractions that we've also, we've been really kind of learning about throughout this quarter. There are a lot of tools that can do um, a lot of things for us. And one of the most important, I think, lessons from systems is knowing what tool is right for the job. Knowing, you know, trusting the compiler, trusting the type system, um, feeling confident that library functions will do the right thing um, in most situations that we could possibly want, and then knowing when we should drop down to something like a void star, knowing when we should be using mem copy instead of a simple equal sign. Um, I think that's. I hope that's one of the things that you know we don't lose sight of the we don't lose sight of as we work through, um, you know, as we've come out of 107. Uh, one of our one of our uh, professors, um, Steve Cooper once told me that like systems is actually unusual even as a field within computer science for the amount of collaboration that needs to happen to just get anything done at all. I found this, this idea really interesting um, because I, I had always kind of thought, well, you know, yeah, I mean, systems is cool, but like if I understand the low level, well, couldn't I, I can kind of just do stuff, right? Uh, but, but Steve reminded me that, no, of course not, right? Like you can't build up a system, any reasonably sized system, without depending on so many other people who came before you and so many other systems and so many other uh, tools and abstractions, right? The operating system, the hardware. So think about all the different levels of abstraction we've learned about so far. Um, the abstraction of caches, right? The abstraction of the ISA when it comes to sort of what the assembly is, is actually doing on the hardware, um, the, the type system, uh, the compi compiler as, a, as an abstraction for kind of you know, optimizing our C code, right? You, you know, and then moving up the chain as well into higher level languages. Um, we, need to understand, we need to understand these abstractions and we need to understand these, so these lower levels sometimes, but we don't want to lose sight of them and we don't want to discard them. Um, and sometimes you can just, you can just say x plus y, you know? Sometimes you can just say array bracket i and everything's going to work out great. Um, and so, so hopefully when you, you know, were you to take uh, pretty much any other class that you can kind of make those, make those balancing and those kind of judgment calls um, you know, as needed, right? Don't rewrite library functions. Um, and, and even like 
hey, you know, we didn't, we never hand generated any assembly because, well, gosh, the compiler was going to do it and it was going to do it better. Um, all good? Okay. Any follow ups on that? So I want to spend the last. You know, the, I want to do sort of the last section here is kind of a where do we go from here? So again, I, I haven't actually written anything up, but um, because I think this is all going to kind of apply to many of you in very different ways. So I, I don't think there's any one path that will work for um, for more than really any one of us. So there's kind of the where. So the where do we go from here? Um, I think this can kind of be broken up into a few different branches. Uh, for people. One branch is the, the sort of the student who went through this class and said, yeah, this is it. I'm totally into this, right? Like, that's not to say it wasn't challenging. I think it's challenging for quite literally everyone uh, in the class. But, you know, who felt like the systems was a pretty good fit. And I guess for that student, you know, the recommendation is pretty easy in a way. It's just, hey, keep taking more systems, right? It's going to be great. Um, 110 and, uh, is the kind of later principles class, um, which is kind of in many ways a, you can think of it as a bit of a, a breadth into what downstream, uh, you know, so, so that kind of student can think of 110 as kind of a breadth class into what downstream systems look like. So what does it look like to work on an operating system? What does it look like to work on a compiler or a networking or like a router um, to write a web server or some kind of bigger application? And that, I hope, can kind of provide some guidance into what downstream classes look like. Um, so that could just, that could be it, right? And, that, and, and if, that, if that's you, fantastic, right? Go for it. Um, keep taking more, more systems. Um, and, and off you go. I think there's another category of, you know, another group of students, probably a much larger group of students in a way, um, who got through 107 and said, you know, like, I still kind of like CS. I still think this is a pretty cool idea. I still like where, where we're going with this. But this just wasn't it. Right? This class, this material wasn't, wasn't it for me. Um, I can tolerate a quarter of C programming. I can deal with the assembly and the low level. But I really miss Java. Right, I really miss the higher level, the like just sort of garbage collected. I don't have to explicitly manage my memory. So what should I do? Right? Is is CS gonna work for me? And to to you I would say, yeah, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. There is a broad spectrum of what computer science is, and what we have shown you here this quarter is only a small subset of that. Um, for you, I would say, you know, if you were looking at declaring CS, CS 110 is, is a core class. It is required. It is, and it's, it is going to be more systems, but I wouldn't go into that thinking, oh man, this is going to be, you know, more of the same. It's going to be kind of rough. I would look at it as kind of just a, as, as a bit of kind of an extension of today in a sense, as an extension of, so what did I really learn from 107? What can I do with the tools that I've, I've gained that I can actually start applying to these larger things that I'm going to write, to these uh, higher level applications? Um, so you can think of 110 as just kind of a, as a breadth class for stuff that maybe you aren't going to continue in, right? Maybe you just won't take the operating systems or the compilers class, but just kind of having a little bit of working knowledge of what's going on there uh, can help you to you know, get into that and then say, all right, well, now, now what should I do, right? And with a combination of, with, certainly with 107, and I think um, for some classes, maybe with 110, like, you're in a pretty good spot to go explore a variety of other, uh, really just anything else in CS. Um, so we've got, there's the math side, there's sort of the, the theory, the 103, 109 kind of space, uh, there's the AI, kind of stuff, which is super in right now, right? Um, and then there's, there's a lot of different, um, it's kind of the, the graphics, the HCI, the data management. There's a lot, of, a lot of stuff that's very relevant that can you know, make some, do some pretty cool things uh, that I think is, is, definitely, is definitely open to you. Um, and then I would say 
maybe there's the, you know the the other ca there's another category of student who's just like yeah well you know maybe I maybe I'm not going into CS right um, I think that's you know, you know like this is maybe a bit of a more relevant message for 106B but nevertheless I, I think there's still a, a good group of people who are here you know who are you know, in SimSys or MCS or or some other engineering major, for example, or, or even just kind of something completely different, who's like, okay, well, well what was the point, right? I, I sat through nine weeks of this. Um, well, am I going to get anything out of 107? And I think that uh, a lot of that is going to come down to that kind of the confidence and the tools and the, the just sort of knowing, yes, this is how my computer works. Yes, this is how I can get something done. This is how I can solve a problem um, even when this was just kind of not the space that I was I was looking in, um, and I think you know that that kind of skill is going to still be really valuable. Um, were you to consider some some kind of applications, you know, even outside of the sort of mainstream CS curriculum and and outside of a sort of a classic software engineering position or software developer position, um, the kind of self sufficiency, the kind of problem solving, uh, just sort of you know, putting on your, your hard hats and just kind of going at it. Um, the sort of, um, I think the term is sort of the in, kind of industriousness about, of, of what you've gotten from, from this class, I think is, is also still really valuable. Um, so hopefully you can feel that whatever group you're a part of kind of fits into that, um, you, you know, that, that you still, like, you feel, still feel that 107 fit into that, um, into some kind of role for you. Um, so maybe now I'll just, I'll just open it up to questions. I guess I have a couple of other, you know, little things I could talk about. I don't know, like specific classes, specific tracks, job opportunities, internships, research, section leading. These are all exciting things um, that you could do. So I'll just open it up to open it up to you. What, you know, what are your thoughts? Any any comments about about the class or any questions about where to go from here? What you're thinking? Sure. What were some of your favorite classes? What were some of my favorite classes? Um, so I'll just be straight up. Like I was really into systems. Uh, I got really into it like really quickly. Um, I think 107 was probably just actually one of, if not the favorite class that I had. Um, so I did actually really enjoy kind of working on the sort of the big projects. Uh, I really liked operating systems. That's CS140. Um, I had a really good team, and we just kind of. We just did it. Uh, I think I told one or two people this story already that I um, maybe had some pretty epic bugs and some pretty good stories that came out of that. Um, you know, bugs that last days that you just like, we all just sit in a room and we're like, where's the bug? Where, where is it? What are we going to do? Right? And like, we're all GDBing and maybe somebody, you know, one of my team members is like, no, no, I'm going to print half my way through this. And we're like, don't do that. Um, there was actually an amazing bug in, in 140. It was actually the, one of the first bugs I ever encountered um, was so I was working on some stuff and then my partner was working on some stuff and we were kind of going and then I get some code that you know sort of works and he doesn't and he's like I don't understand what's going on and like all the timings are off and everything and I said well you know you know didn't you implement it kind of as we said and he's like yeah yeah I have that um, and at some point he was like, I was like, oh, well, what's this number? He's like, well, I don't know. Right now, like, I've got thousands of printfs. I don't know what's going on. And I said, hey, um, is it possible that the printf is your problem? Is it possible that the printf is messing with your timing? Why don't you try deleting all of them? And he deleted all of them, and his code worked. <laughs> and he was like, what happened? I'm like, dude, you can't do that, right? The printf will just mess with everything in the operating system. And so uh, GDB, GDB is good. Um, uh, another favorite actually another really favorite class of mine was the senior project class, CS194. Um, I took it actually pretty early. I did not take it when I was a senior, but I, I really liked, I really, I, so uh, maybe this says something about my work style, this says something about kind of just the way I, I like to work, and that's, you know, pretty specific to me, but I really liked the autonomy of just being able to sit down. So I worked with actually the same person, because um, I didn't learn my lesson. No, but he was really good. He actually created some really awesome stuff and we we sat down and we were like we're gonna make a project and it's gonna be huge we're gonna make this like you know massive like I don't know what we were doing it was some huge <laughs> uh, it was some we had this idea to make this huge huge like game of some 
order of magnitude that we never achieved. Um, and, and so we just sat down and we said, oh, we're going to use this like crazy new fancy technology. And, and we just did it. And uh, against the advice of our TA, who was like, I don't know if you should use that technology because none of us are going to be able to help you, we said, no, no, we're going to do this. It's going to be great. And, and we start working through it. And it was just kind of fun. It was just really nice to be able to really design something kind of from the ground up um, to be able to say, yeah, like, hey, so you know, to kind of set up these abstractions um, is something that I think is, is pretty uncommon. Um, in a lot of classes, even sort of downstream, right? For me to tell him, all right, so I'm going to write a method. I'm going to write a function that does this. And the output's going to look like this. And I'm assuming these parameters are like this. And for him to say, oh, no, 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 that's not going to work, right? I need the parameters like this so that you, whatever. And, and really kind of designing those interfaces, um, sometimes on the whiteboard, sometimes in a, in a header file, just really kind of scratching it out. We were actually working in two separate languages also. So then, you know, we couldn't really just sort of mismatch the code at all. Um, so there needed to be this very clear separation. And I totally appreciated just being able to do that kind of big picture software design kind of space. Um, so I don't know. Those were a couple of them. Can you talk a little bit about section Yeah. When is a good time to get involved, and how do you get involved in CS one seven? Uh, so, so section leading, yeah. So section leading is an awesome program. Um, the CS198, so it's, it's generally referred to as CS198. We've got a, uh, a few grad students who are kind of coordinating all of that, um, who've all who've been section leaders and have, you know really are are doing a great job, kind of training, training our section leaders and getting getting them into a good spot to help out with the the 106s. Uh, so every quarter, there's a in terms of how the mechanics of how to get involved. Every quarter, there's an application process where you uh, where you you apply. There's an interview process where you sort of demonstrate some of your your debugging skills. Hint: pointers always show up on the debugging interview. Um, there's where you demonstrate some of your your teaching, and then and it's an awesome community of people who are generally not only really excited about teaching and really excited about helping other students, but are also just really cool people, really smart people. Um, there's always a lot of cool opportunities, tech talks, free, all sorts of whatever, um, and, and just sort of great opportunities. So I highly recommend that. Um, as a coming out of 107, you're all very equipped to, uh, to help out with the kind of the you know any kind of 106b pointer linked list kind of problems things like that, um, and so you should all feel pretty good about being able to walk into that. Um, the downstream courses, so I should say the the section leading program applies to the the 106s, uh, 106a, b, and x. Um, downstream, uh, so here in 107 as well as in the other classes 103, 109, 110, um, we've got we we uh, work with grad student TAs. They're often co-terms, um, so. Uh, they're often almost always people who have taken the class. And so if that seems like something you'd maybe be interested in, if, if you're maybe interested in a co-term or something like that, then maybe keep that on your radar. And in which case, section leading is a great kind of head start into that. And is a great way to just kind of you know, get a feel for what teaching is like. And I can tell you when we start looking for TAs, um, 107, 110, we're all pretty much in agreement that we, we first thing we look for is who's been a section leader, right? Because that's that will definitely be a sign of someone who is a, a solid candidate whom we're going to want on our side. Um, so yeah, it's a fun program. I did it for a few quarters um, before I got into 107 uh, TAing. Um, it's just it's really fun to see, to meet all the all the new students, right? It's really fun to just kind of um, I really like A actually. I really like just you know all the new students are like oh my gosh this is so cool like you know I can make breakout I can make all these things and and then the community is just kind of an awesome little. Awesome little social social dynamic there. Anything else? Any, anything that's not specifically class related? Anything like, you know, how do I get a job? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> research. What are the most exciting like areas of systems research? Currently, do you think? Like, what's going to be like the next big thing? Sure, sure. So, so like areas of systems research. What, what do I think is the next big thing? Man, I, I feel pretty unqualified to answer this. So, it was, um, well, we have uh, uh, during the fall and winter we have uh, our department chair, uh, Professor Alex Aiken, come in and give a talk about his um, research topic, and it's one of the research, uh, one of the, the areas of research that he works on, and it's actually really cool. It's a, it's a, it's a 
how does this work again? It's a, it's a probabilistic optimizer. So it'll like take your assembly code, or maybe it takes your, I think it takes your assembly code, right? And it just like, and it, it runs it through. Oh, right. So, okay. It, the way it works is it, it takes your, it takes some program, right? And then it will like probabilistically like, okay, so it'll like generate a, you know, I don't know, millions of test cases or something and just throw stuff at it. And then it will, perturb the program. Like it will, you know, change i plus one to i plus two and i plus one to i minus one and ampersands and stars all over the place. And and um, after I don't know a few million iterations, they'll get another program that works and it might be just a little bit faster. And he keeps doing this and eventually it actually comes out with some pretty impressive um, assembly. So there's a lot of stuff going on in I mean it kind of depends on the area. There's a lot of stuff going on in in uh, that kind of Compilers, optimization, stuff like that. There's a lot of, I think one of the big things that is still pretty active is uh, virtualization. So finding a good way to make use of, uh, we have a lot of hardware on our machines right now um, that is actually not being used pretty often. And so being able to find a good way to make use of that. Um, there's of course, there's a lot of scalability and kind of high performance discussions. So uh, like I think Google, like, five or six years ago, completely changed their data center infrastructure um, to use some stuff that actually came out of Stanford uh, less than a decade ago um, called Software Defined Networks. And they, they just like, they're like, yeah, this seems like cool, we're just gonna do it. And that's still a very active area of, of that. Um, you know, so a lot of it, it's interesting, right? So, so research is one of those interesting areas where it's not always clear how uh, it connects to industry, but I've often actually been really surprised by, uh, as I'm kind of, you know, talking to some people about systems research or reading about some some article, and then just hearing, like, oh yeah, yeah, Google uses that. Like, oh really? Like that's kind of cool. That was invented like five or six years ago. That was invented ten years ago. Um, there's a surprising amount of tech transfer, right, that happens between um, academia and industry. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of kind of R and D that happens in industry actually as well. Um, and I think it's actually pretty, pretty exciting, right? So you can see that a lot of the like, the AI research, for example, is is really kind of like self-driving cars, that kind of thing, right? They're they're doing it, right? They're actually trying to build these things and make them happen. And 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 while it may be a little bit harder to see that happen in systems, it may be a little harder to say, oh well, you know, I see that Windows did X or that Mac OS did did Y. You can see um, they, these things are actually happening. Actually, the one thing I can think of is. Uh, there was another research project that was, I think, happened within the next last 15 years, and that was implemented in the most recent version of Windows. Um, they're like, oh yeah, this seems like a good idea. This will make data center performance like 50% faster. We're going to do it. Um, and then Mac OS actually implemented a really sweet little security feature in El Capitan uh, that I ran into while trying to fix uh, my mom's Mac, and I had to turn it off by going into the terminal and hacking a thing because it <laughs> broke the updater. But that's a different story. Um, but anyway, it was, it was, but you know, like that was the kind of thing. And actually, it was something that I had learned about in 140, right? I was taking an operating systems class, and they were saying, oh, yeah, blah, blah, you know, security, blah, 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 here's how we did it. And then I, I, do a little bit of Googling and they're like, oh yeah, that's in El Capitan and you know, here's how it impacts the situation. I said, oh, oh, neat. So it's all very relevant, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, it's, all, it's all happening. Anything else? Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess maybe just a, a little bit of a mention about like, you know, internships and, and jobs and things, right? I think one of seven, I think the, the standard, the word on the street is that 107 is very much a, a, a gateway into that kind of, uh, those kind of aspects as well. Um, just because, right, there's, there is like, and, and even, for, even for companies that aren't going to ever ask you to program in C, right? Again, it's the, it's the confidence, it's the tools, it's the abstractions. Um, they just want to know that you've taken 107. And then there are companies that, that do work in C, and they, they want to know that you can do some bitwise. They want to know that you can do some, um, uh, you know, they want to know that you can do some uh, some pointers and some memory, um, and you can tell them that you probably know more about floats than most engineers, um, because that's kind of how it is at this point. Um, and it's all so. Hopefully, you feel like there's a there's some good opportunities there, uh, whatever you're, whatever space you're interested in. Any kind of finishing thoughts? Miss anything?
Okay. Uh, I should say that. Could you talk about why, why we do code review and why we're the last class that's ah, yeah. Thanks. Um, so so the, the comment is sort of, it's, this is about sort of, um, so you may have noticed that throughout the assignments, um, you know, we've been doing some pretty intensive um, code reviews and sort of style feedback. Um, and, and the thing is, you know, so you may have heard this when we talked about or when in like 106, I, like maybe maybe the 106s may have mentioned this the, the idea that we write code for people, um, not for computers, and and that on one hand it is important to make sure that our code works. It's important to make sure that it, it produces the right output, which is why we simultaneously move towards you know the output based kind of grading of of your programs. But a lot of it comes to but a lot of industry and a lot of academia and a lot of just kind of downstream is really going to count on you writing code that other people can read, right? So, you know, when I talked about the classes that I really enjoyed, I enjoyed them because I got to work with friends of mine. And part of the reason I enjoyed being able to work with my friends was that I knew that they would write good code, right? I knew that whenever they would commit something into the version control that I could open it up and I wouldn't be like, uh, what, what does this do? Right? I don't understand. Um, and it, and it makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference in, in terms of just being able to um, make progress in reading somebody else's code, in terms of reading your own code. Actually, about a week ago, I went back and looked at my old 107 code. And boy, it's, it's a thing. Uh, it sure is a thing. But you know, I actually kind of see myself sort of, and I, I remember consciously thinking this, um, trying to change up my style over the course of the quarter and thinking about, oh, well, you know, should I, uh, you know, how should I write these lines and just little things sometimes, but like whether I should use different forms of capitalization or how I should name my methods and things like that. And like, um, and I, I kind of appreciate that because kind of by assignment six and seven, I look back and that, yeah, that's actually now my coding style, right? I do write code that does look very similar um, to the stuff that I was writing in assignment six and seven. And so at this point, you know, hopefully you found that kind of feedback to be useful. Maybe you may have found it a little bit, uh, frustrating at times when you thought, man, you know, I spent hours and hours and hours working through this, this stuff, but, and, and all my TA can say is bad variable names, you know, come on. It's like, you know, what was I going to do at 11.50 in the, at night, right? But, but hopefully um, it gives you a sense for the kinds of things that does make for readable code. And as we kind of move on, uh, there will be much thinner code reviews, even in something like 110. And then um, I think 140 does a pretty aggressive design review, but they're not looking over your code, partly because they kind of just can't, right? They, kinda, they can't just pull up two or 3,000 lines of code and start commenting on your variable names, commenting on your, your method names. But in a lot of ways, uh, they kind of don't have to, because if your code was messy, you were probably punished for it already while trying to work through like a 3,000 line project with bad function names. Um, yeah, so, so kind of hopefully you felt like that was, that, that gave you a sense for what that kind of looks like. But, um, and from here, right, it's going to be all, it's going to be pretty much functionality based, but I hope that you don't, you know, give up on the endeavor to write clean and readable, maintainable code, especially if you work with somebody else. Please don't do that if you work with somebody else. Um, right, which inevitably you will, because that's kind of what computer science is. It's pretty much impossible to do anything on your own these days. Okay. All right. So hopefully you got a good, you know, hopefully this was a worthwhile class for you. Hopefully you can finish it off strong with the heap allocator and then um, feel like you have something to be super proud of and something to, you know, feel like you can, you can take with you uh, for some amount of time to come. Um, so thanks, everybody. Uh, it's been a fun class, and I hope I wish you best of luck as we. Thank you.